Acts chapter 8, and we're going to begin reading in verse 18. Acts chapter 8, beginning in verse 18. The Bible says, And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that whomsoever I lay hands on, he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God might be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in the matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in a gall of bitterness, and in the bond of iniquity. I'd like to preach this morning, the Lord being my helper, uh, living for Christ, but still bound. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you and give you great glory and honor for your word. Down through the years of more, uh, more people than we can number, what a great help it's been, what a comfort in time of sorrow. And we give you the praise for that. We thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit. This morning, Lord, we pray that you would send it our way and that you would uh, mingle your word and take it in the hearts of those that are listening in any way that they are listening. God, help us as a people together that you would grow our church, that you would grow its ministries. Uh, meet with us today, and we'd be faithful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it all. For it is in Christ's name that we do ask. Amen. Amen. Now, maybe some not-so-familiar verses of the Acts. Uh, uh, sometimes uh, we want to skip over this book because a lot of people think it uh, gives credence to Pentecostal doctrine, but it does not. It, it's our book, and we need to study each part of it. And we find a fairly familiar section where an individual shows himself for who he is. Uh, that his inner man is revealed and it's not what it seems to be. You know, the revelation of the inward man is something that comes from God and not from man. You know who will, will give you acknowledgement of your salvation is the Holy Ghost and who will make you of a certainty that you have nothing is the Holy Ghost as well. That, that, the, the Bible says this, that those things are spiritually discerned. And in, in other words, you can't read the, the Bible and say, oh yeah, I have that for sure. It has to be spirit given. And that's something that's not taught today. But listen, that word is nothing more than a book if you're not saved. It's, if, the, if the Holy Spirit does not guide you and does it not save you, it'll collect dust on the shelf somewhere because it means little to nothing to the natural man. Now, anytime you read a section of the Word of God, you always want to go back a little way and get what is going on, especially with the, the story of Simon and what happened to him. So going back to verse uh, the first verse of this chapter, the Bible says, And Saul was consenting unto his, meaning Stephen's, death. Now, uh, I, I'll just throw this in here. Now, I believe that uh, Saul was troubled by the Holy Ghost before he was saved, but I want you to see that he was still consenting. He was still okay. He was still glad about Stephen's death. Uh, you, you know what uh, people are that are lost? They're glad about sin. When they see it, they revel in it. When, when they get to experience it, they love it. And really the only thing that's different between them and us is that we ought to be ashamed of it when it creeps into our life. That, that's the real difference between the lost and the redeemed it is, it is that uh, do they grieve over sin or do they revel in it? So I want you to see, at least from the context, I think Paul had no conviction as of yet of the Holy Ghost because he was consenting to that. He was glad about it. And Saul was consenting unto his death, and at that time there was great persecution against the church that was at Jerusalem. Now, 
This is my own opinion. You can take it for what it's worth. I believe all the misery that the first church experienced was because they were not obedient unto Christ. He said, go, and they didn't. And I believe when a church gives up its obedience to Christ, you can look out, trouble's on the way. Uh, I believe I've really in my own lifetime see, seen churches end for a lack of obedience to Christ. You know what? I don't know what's going to happen in Paris. I pray that the Lord is going to organize a great church and there'll be a testimony there for many years. But I do know this, we're being obedient. He said, go, and we've sent someone out. And that, that's what a church needs to do if it wants to stay apart from the judgment of God, then we need to be obedient. And, and not as, just obedient as individuals, but obedient as a church. And so we'll find that all through the Acts and even after that, in the epistles of Peter and James, we still find the church at Jerusalem getting beat up for disobedience. And uh, many churches are like that today. Uh, and devout men, verse 2, carried Stephen to his burial. There is a sanction for burial. We don't need to be burning people up. That's a, a pagan custom. That's extra that you can take to the house with you. And devout men carried Stephen to, bur to burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church. Again, his nature has not changed. You know what? You know what redemption will give you? What's true salvation? It'll change your nature. And, and if that never happened, dear friend, probably you've never been saved to start with. If you still have a rebellious nature, if you still have a nature that's against the Word of God, if the Word of God still, uh, still, is still distasteful for you, what you probably need is to be born again. What you probably need is salvation. And, and Paul was simply displaying himself for who he was and what he didn't possess. And so we see that that's what he did. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hauling them and hauling men and women and uh, women committed them to prison. Now, listen, this seems absurd to us, but listen, things keep going like they are, it's going to be that, th that this is just as illegal as it was then. That meeting in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be against the law. Meeting and, and preaching truth about sodomites, listen, it's going to get some backlash. It's going to be some trouble there. And, and so really right now, uh, before the time gets rough, what we need to do is pray for strength. Now, if you're lost, I can tell you exactly what you do. You'll agree with it. You'll, you'll go right in with it. And if you're saved, it will be distasteful. It will be, it will be something that, that makes you uh, upset at the very thought of it, and you will stand in the last day. <clears throat> and the Lord God will give you strength to do so. So we find Stephen was acting toward his character. Stephen was acting just like his inward man dictated him to act. And you will do the exact same thing. If you're lost, you'll act like a lost person. And if you're saved, you will have fruits meet for repentance. Right. And really, that repentance is what differs us from the lost. Mm -hmm. Verse 4. Therefore, they were scattered abroad. Now that's the result of being persecuted. But what was their command at the day of the ascension? Go ye into all the world preaching. That was what they were given to do. And they, the best we know, uh, the only thing he said, wait till you're in due with power from on high. Right. And we find the record of that in chapter 2 of the book of Acts. And they were in due and they still said still. You ever wonder why they did that? Besides the fact they were Baptists? I think they were scared, don't you? Mm -hmm. uh, I, fear will cripple you. Yeah. Fear will keep you right where you're at. And listen, again, we've not experienced that yet. I believe we will. But we've not experienced that yet. So you can't criticize them much 
But, I mean, they just saw Stephen's head, uh, they just saw Stephen stoned to death. That, that gets your attention. Uh, anybody ever seen someone die besides just a natural way? Uh, I, I've seen unbelievable things when I was worked for the Ando service. Stuff that I will remember the rest of my life. Uh, I'm not, you know, uh, everybody thinks it's crazy, but there are more pleasant ways to die. <laughs> And Stephen went through something unbelievable. He literally was stoned to death. It was graphic. It was horrible. And you know what? If you'd be held it, it probably slowed you down a little bit too. Yeah. And, and, and so we find that, yes, we can criticize them, and they suffered much but because their lack of missionary zeal at First Baptist Jerusalem. But at the very same time, I want you to see that I don't know that we would have done anything much different than what they did. Verse 5, then Philip went down to the city of Samaria. So they're scattered. They're sent out by force. They're fearful, thinking they're going to die. And we find Philip on the move. Now, Philip was an apostle. He was apostolic, uh, meaning that he was one of the chosen. And he was doing the work of an apostle in that day. Then Philip went down and to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. Now, I believe it was Adam, or maybe it was Brother Junior, I can't remember, recently talked about the Samaritan woman. And we looked into her life, we looked what made her tick, we looked at her situation, and when the Lord saved her, the Lord Jesus Christ himself giving testimony, he said, I am he. The very first person he said that to, the Lord did a work and she left her water pot at the well and ran down and said, hey, there's a man out there who told me whatever I've ever done, come see him. That was the same city. That was the same town. And we find him going back again. You know, uh, I don't know what had happened at Samaria. I personally believe there were a number of people saved because it said it and they believed, right? Uh, when they did come back and they saw the Lord Jesus. Now we're probably two, three years later, and they're visit the missionaries visiting him again. You, you know what? Someone always needs reassurance. You ever need reassurance? Mm -hmm. Not necessarily of your salvation, but hey, am I doing what the Lord yeah. would have me to do? Yeah. Am I at the right place at the right time mm -hmm. doing what God would have me to do? And so I believe part of Philip's ministry was to get down there and whatever believers were left say, hey, things are going well. You know, uh, you can't write the Bible, but I often wondered if the woman at the well was, was there and talked to, uh, uh, he, uh, talked to Philip of the goodness of God and remembered what God had done for her. Uh, I'm not sure, but I want you to see it was the same city. Verse 9, and the people with one accord, one movement, one event, one, a, a general consensus of the city, and the people with a one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles that he did. Now, let me give you an aside just so you remember. What, what did Christ not do at Samaria? He did no miracles. He, now, he did. He saved somebody. But as far as feeding the 5,000 and, and turning, and turning uh, stones into bread and uh, making water run out of a rock and casting out devils, no record of it at all. So Philip went down and showed them the apostolic gifts. And he healed people. He made the lame to walk. And listen, it got people's attention. And it got people interested in what was going on down in Samaria. Verse um, <clears throat> 7. For unclean spirits. Now, if you write in your Bible, underline that. Unclean spirits. They're still with us. I personally believe it's kind of a, a general consensus, a general, a general statement concerning devils. 
Now we understand and know that a third of the angels were cast into the earth with Satan. They were his followers. They were as much God-haters as he was. He was just their leader. And they're still hindering folks today. They're still hindering the lost. And, and this, you, you follow this out, it's worth what it is. Satan still incarnates people, and so does other devils. If you don't believe that, tell me what happened to Mary Magdalene, right? Of whom the Lord cast out seven devils, right? And, and you know, a lot of things that we write off as mental illness, as health care givers, is nothing more than demonic possession. And I've seen both. I've seen true mental illness. I have read the lab, but, you know, this guy doesn't have enough serotonin, <laughs> right? But on the flip side, I've seen the most mean, evil people. And really nothing wrong with them physically or mentally. And they are demonically possessed. When, when did Baptists quit teaching that? When did it become a Pentecostal or an apostolic teaching? You know what I think it is? I think we're afraid of it. Because if you're lost, and your heart has not been sealed to the day of redemption, by default, you can be possessed, right? The door's wide open. We left the door open, the air. Anybody want to come in here? But if you shut and lock the door, you seal it. Nobody can in. You see what I'm saying? And, and, and so we find then that we don't need to tiptoe around this. And I believe we would identify and see it a lot more. And we say, yeah, that's very much a possibility. In 2021, this thing still happens. For the unclean spirit, crying with a loud voice, came out of many, many, not one instance, and that were possessed with them. And many were taken with palsies physical illness, and that were lame were healed, and there was great joy in the city. You know what? I've never seen a whole city revival, have you? I don't know that I've seen very many church revivals, much less a whole city. Um, you know, I've heard both sides of the fence on Great Awakening, haven't you? I've heard that it was very biblical and the Lord did great things, and I've heard also that it was it was all a sham, that people were just getting emotional. Uh, I'm not sure which is true. I, I tend to go at least part of it with genuine. Uh, so why does that happen anymore? What's your first impulse of good sovereign grace, sir? Well, God just don't live like that anymore. Well, where's our fault in that? I think Jared did an excellent job on sovereignty and the responsibility of man, how they're co-entities, don't you? Uh, something's wrong, isn't it? Uh, salvation, because of Armenian teaching, is not cherished anymore. Mm -hmm. You know what? It's really not. It's something that there's no way, no possibility, never, ever, ever, you could obtain on your own. And it was given you by the goodness of God. See, that, that's what makes you a treasure and, and something to be loved, not something you ask for or, or that you just got because you said the right thing. And I believe that's the real thing. I believe if we had great joy over salvation, we would, uh, we would share it more with others. But there was a certain man. Now we get down to specifics. Now we get down to one individual. The city had a revival, and now we get down to one fellow. And there was a certain man called Simon, which before time, before all these events, before the revival occurred, which before time, in the city, used sorcery and bewitched people. <clears throat> now, be very, very clear on this one. That's still very much a real thing. Very much a reality. Now, uh, good and bad. Good that most people have never experienced it. Bad that I have. You go to a rock concert and all it is is sorcery. I've seen it. I understand it. I know it. 
what those people are doing is manipulating you. What those people are doing is putting thoughts in your head that you'll never get rid of. What those people are putting images in your head that you can't forget when you want to forget them. You see what I'm saying? And putting that image of something that's not really real is sorcery by definition. It's witchcraft by definition, right? And, and, and so we find that that was Simon. And Simon's message wasn't that, uh, you know, Led Zeppelin was a great group or Motley Crue was the it for the 80s. His, his defied message, his lying message was that he was a great one. You know what? I've seen a lot of preachers like that. Have you? That they were the king dog. That they were up here and all the other little peasants were down here. And you're talking about preachers of the Word of God. If you don't believe me, think about uh, the different ones that are out there today. Benny Hinn. You know what? He thought he was above everything else. Now, uh, uh, y'all don't remember this one. Uh, but Jim Baker, I got one one sister that remembers that with me. He was a devil from the inside out, and the entire nation followed him. You know why? Because he was a sorcerer. He could present himself any way he wished. That's a sorcerer. Be careful of those people. You know why uh, the rust lights can knock on your door and present like they're a Betty Crocker? Because they're sorcerers. They change the reality to what you want to see. And so we find then that as the Lord's people, certainly we should be very aware. And that was, that was Simon's thing. That's how he earned his money. That's how he made his living. That's how he used control over his people. <coughs> now, also says he used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving himself out that he was some great one to whom they all gave heed. Now, you think about this morning, you say, well, I would never do that. Well, you give heed if you believe them. And you know what? What I have found with false prophets is this. They'll start out and tell, they, tell you they believe exactly like you do. There are five pointers down the road. And then they come in, and little by little, uh, I'm trying to think of the two prophets in Jude. That's what happened to that church. Jannies and Jamboree's. That's what happened there. And you know what Jannies and Jamboree's problem was? They were fakes. You know, that's a revealed truth. And we'll see just in a moment, as in the days of Simon, maybe Simon thought he was real. Maybe Simon experienced something, but didn't experience truth. And we'll see that the Bible even documents he must have made some kind of profession of faith because it says, and Simon believed also. Notice what it says, to whom they all gave heed, verse 10, from the least to the greatest, that this man is, what? The great power of God Capital G, cap uh, uh, indicating the very great God Jehovah. These were half breed Jews. They believed uh, the only thing they differed. They were Ishmaelites instead of instead of following the ways of uh, of uh, uh, Jacob. But I want you to see that they knew some truth. Remember the woman at the well. He said, what are you doing here? You're not supposed to be here. You're supposed to be worshiping in Jerusalem, and we worship in this mountain. Right. So, he was, he was teaching God. You, you know what a lot of false prophets do? They teach God. And they're very, very, very convincing. Right? I've seen a lot of people pull, pulled in. Now, I'm not going to say names, but there is a large church that has a huge school even with homeschooling materials in northern Florida, right? And this, this, this people, you know what they do? They deceive people. <clears throat> you want to talk about Armenian? Man, I mean, 
I, I don't even know if they have five steps. I thought they have two. <laughs> right? And you know what that is results? You have a church full of lost people. And when you have a, a church full of lost people, the door is wide open to his use. And, and that's what the devil wants. If he can get in here, remember what he said to the, I think it was to the church at Philadelphia, maybe. I know where Satan seed is. Now, personally, in the modern day, I don't know if he wastes his time on us. He's no dummy. Right? Remember how it said Job? Satan always approached Job individually. And that's because Job was a hard enough to crack. And back he never was cracked. The devil thought he could get away with it, but he didn't. I wonder if he even sends his imps our way. If he wastes time with a, with a little devil like was in Mary Magdalene. Well, no. The capability is still there, right? And, and, and so we find that <laughs> this man that was a deceiver of other people who, who presented himself what as a man of God, not a demon, not a black one, not, not, not an evil thing, but as a man of God. And to him they had regard because of a long time he bewitched them with sorceries. But when they believed Philip preaching concerning the kingdom of God, and in the name of Jesus Christ they were baptized, both men and women, then Simon himself believed also. Now, we have to have faith and trust and belief. I understand that. But you know what, church? This makes four. Two plus two make four. There's no redemptive power in that. The fact that Jesus was a man and lived among us is historical. There's no redemptive power in the fact of knowing that Jesus walked the earth. Right. None whatsoever. If he don't come in and individually rip that lock off your heart, if he don't come in individually and present himself as the savior of your soul, listen, dear friend, you'll never ever be saved. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Uh, and, and so we find then that Simon believed, but apparently he didn't give a real dose of salvation. Apparently there was no indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Apparently he had not been genuinely born again as the Lord Jesus uh, urged Nicodemus in that day. Apparently all it was was simple logic. And listen, this brain, this logic is just as filthy as the rest of me and it is a deceiver so you be very, very careful. Then Simon believed also. And when he was baptized, again, no redemptive quality, because we'll see how he was late later, he continued with Philip, praising God, giving him high praise, cherishing salvation. No, no, look what it says. He continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and the sign which were done. He was impressed with what he could see, right? Would to God we have a, a day where we would be impressed with what we couldn't see. Right. Right? Can you look at me and tell if I'm saved? No. You can't see it, right? But hopefully it breaks out on me like chicken pox. And so we see, we see then that it wasn't so much of the drawing of the Holy Spirit, he was interested in what they were doing. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them Peter and John. And when they were come down, meaning from Jerusalem to Samaria, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they that were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, I'll leave that to your hands. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw 
Now, I don't know what this spectacular event was. I don't believe it was flopping and foaming at the mouth on the floor because there's no documentation to that end, right? I don't believe it was acting like a crazy fool, but something happened, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and they prayed, they received the Holy Ghost, and there had to be something to be seen because, see, Simon was a seer. Simon was something that, that was impressed by miracles. Simon was an individual that liked to see miraculous things. You see what I'm saying? So I don't know what exactly happened here, but I do know that visually Simon was very, very impressed with what had occurred, and he wanted some of it. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. The Bible says this, the love, not money, the love of money is the root of all evil. So what had to be still possessive in the life of Simon? He loved the root of evil. <laughs> he loved the root of evil. The root of evil. The love of money. Verse 19, saying, Give me also this power, that whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. Now, I want you to see, first of all, that he didn't get it because he thought the power was in the apostle when the power was in God, mm -hmm. was in Christ. Secondly, he had no understanding of the apostolic office. Why couldn't Simon be an apostle? He never saw Christ in the flesh, did he? Disqualifies him. Says he can't be. That's why the apostolic office is dead, church, is because nobody living today has seen Christ in the flesh, right? And, and, and so we find... And you know what? I don't think the apostles was hesitant to teach that, do you? The only thing I come to is he wasn't listening. Right? You ever sat through the whole church service and never heard a thing? Now, if you if you say no, you're lying to me, right? Because I've been on that side of the pew, and I hate when the sermon is boring, don't you? And, and, and you know what I've had to do over the years is say, hey, there's some little nugget in there for me. I just have to look for it. I have to have both ears open, need both hearing aids in, because there's something good in there for me. Uh, so apparently he missed it. You know what the best thing for Christians and young preachers? Just listen. Just listen. Sit under teaching. And, and so we find that whatever was wrong, and again, you know, I believe saved people soak up the Word of God like a dry sponge soaks up water. And I believe that this man was lost and he never ever tasted of the goodness of God. Notice what he, the Peter says in verse 20, the pastor. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought the gift of God. What is the gift of God? Salvation, is it not? Uh, what is the gift of God? Is it not understanding the person of Christ? Is it not the forgiving of sin? Is that not the gift of God? And, and somehow, someway, <laughs> Simon thought it was something he could buy. Because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part, part nor lot in this matter. How did Peter come to that conclusion? Man, that's pretty stiff words, ain't it? Uh, I've been pastoring 26 years, and I've never said, your loss is the biggest in a hailstorm. Right? And you know why? Because I can't see. But apparently the apostles had a little bit different insight than this old Baptist preacher. Because if you don't have any lot in this, what's a lot? Something you own in it. The lot next to the church, we own. That's ours. Right? It was purchased. It belongs to us. It's a lot. It's a legal decree. 
Because if you don't have this, you don't possess this, you don't own this, it does not belong to you. And, and so this wonderful insight that, that Peter is given about the spiritual condition of a lost man really is from how, how he behaved and what he did. Then he says, For thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Now in the mo modern day, we can fool a lot of people, can we not? I'll tell you a story. This just an aside, but this just shows how you can fool people. When I lived over in West Tennessee and was going to nursing school, there was a little nursing home right in Dresden. Uh, Governor Ned Blair McCorder owned it. Y'all, no, y'all don't remember him. Again, uh, uh, I know that Sister uh, Brenda remembers Ned Ray. I showed you where he lived at in the lake. And so he, he owned a little nursing home there. And there was a nurse there. She was an African-American lady. Excellent nurse. Just did a wonderful job. Well, after some looking in, one day they realized that she had a little bit of beard coming in. And I thought, this is weird. And they got to watch him, and they got to look at her nurse's license. And what really was, he found the nurse's license. Yes, he found the nurse's license on the street and took up this woman's identity. And the weird thing is, he was a good nurse. <laughs> right? You know what? He deceived everybody, but he hadn't deceived God. And you may have deceived everybody. You may have the right look. You might have the right words. You might have everything in place. But I'll tell you this, you're not deceiving God. And so we find then that we need to be real honest. And apparently Simon was not. Thou hast neither lot or part in the matter of thy heart, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent. Therefore, what was the first message of Christ? Repent. What was the first message of John the Baptist? Repent. I wonder if this is the first one he ever heard spiritually. Repent. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceivest that thou art in a gall of bitterness. Now that word gall is the very same word we use in modern day for bile. Bile is secreted by your liver. It's, it's housed in the gall bladder. And it's excreted into your intestines to help you to, uh, to uh, digest fats. Brother Junior just had his all broke out, right? And uh, have you ever thought up and it was green and it burned like fire from here to here? That is by. And it, it comes this way just like it goes that way. You see what I'm saying? He was hurting. He was burning. He he was sick. Did you ever get sick of sin? I tell you what, if you get sick of sin, you're not far from the kingdom of God. But if you revel in it, and you enjoy it, and you like it, you've probably never been born again to start with it. And, and so we find that this, uh, <clears throat> this Simon was still bitter. He was still angry. He was still filled uh, with ungodly things. And notice this. And he and in the bond. What is a bond? You're tied up. You know what? When you're cuffed up like this, you're bound. And you know what? When you're cuffed up like this and you're going off to the popo, you don't have control of yourself. Right? Now, I've been, never been arrested, praise God, but I've heard a lot about it from my, my uh, director of nursing niece over at the jail. And 
she had asked me to come work for her, and I said no. And uh, the reason why is not that I don't like Jessica. She told me how they got them in there. When they come down in there, and they're, they're locked up, you get stripped from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet. Like old me. And then they do a very thorough exam. You see what I'm saying? Be sure you're not hiding anything. <laughs> and uh, then they throw you into an orange jumpsuit. When you're, when you're like, okay, you can't control yourself, can you? You know, people that are lost think they're their own body and their own thing and everything is under their control. What you really are under the control of Satan. What you're really under the control of is his imps. And you don't know how miserable you really are. You know, that's a revealed truth. The misery of sin is a revealed truth. And when someone sees that, they cannot be far from the kingdom of God. And so we find a spiritual summation of Simon. Then answered Simon and said, Pray you to the Lord for me, that none of these things which, I, which ye have spoken come upon me. Now I don't, know, I don't mind being asked to pray for people, but I'll ask you this. Why do you ask Peter to do it? Pray for yourself, right? My own opinion is this, he, he didn't have the ability to pray because he was lost. Mm -hmm. And he knew it. He said, Peter, pray for me. And then we never hear a song again. What was he saved? I don't know. You don't have any recording of him being saved. You've got to go say that. I believe Peter was faithful to the prayer. That's who kind of man Peter was. But I don't know that he was saved. So we find you can look the look. You can walk, walk the walk and you can talk the talk. But it don't make you redeemed. And what I found is eventually break out on you. Had a lot of people come and go in New Testament over the last 21 years. And you know what, what I found, and not being judgmental, I'm just going by the, the, the fruits in their life, a faith will last about three years. And someone that loves and nurtures and, and craves the thing of Christ, they're there. Boy, when you get this mission going, they're going to come and go. But let them come and go. You see what I'm saying? So which one are you in? Are you a Simon? Are you an individual that puts on a good show? Or are you like Peter, the very one who gave him advice? Thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. And he says, Peter, flesh and blood have not revealed it unto thee, but my Father, which is in heaven. Right? That's why Pensacola can't be right. <laughs> right? And so we need to understand and know this morning where we're at. That's a revealed truth. Have you really been saved? I would to God that would be the history of my ministry, just asking people, do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you? Very important that you be very honest. 